All right. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Tim Fisher, a professor at UCLA, and I'm the department chair in mechanical and aerospace engineering. And it is my privilege to open the proceedings today. Uh, we have a great event on uh, aerospace technology and its future in the greater Los Angeles area. It should be a really exciting uh, set of speakers that we have for you. Um, and if you wanna participate uh, as, an, as audience members, uh, you can, you'll see instructions in the chat room uh, and th those will come at the appropriate time in the meeting today. Um, this is a, an event that's a collaboration between uh, UCLA Engineering and UCLA Anderson and Jerry Nicholsberg is the moderator for the Anderson forecast and he's gonna take it from here. So thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Tim, and uh, welcome and good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jerry Nicholsberg, faculty director of the UCLA Anderson forecast. And the UCLA Anderson forecast is really pleased to be co-sponsoring this conference on aerospace technology in Los Angeles. Uh, at the forecast, we try to reach out across campus to bring together the deep expertise at UCLA, including that at the Luskin School of Public Affairs, UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television, UCLA School of Law, Institute of the Environment, and today uh, in conjunction with the Henry Samueli School of Engineering and Applied Science. As my background is both in aerospace and economics, it's a real pleasure to be able to organize this event with Professor Tim Fisher in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. To kick off our event, it is my pleasure to introduce the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost and Distinguished Professor of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering, Emily Carter. From 2016 to 2019, she served as Princeton University's Dean of Engineering and Applied Science. Professor Carter developed her academic career at UCLA from 1988 to 2004, where she helped to launch two institutes the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics and the California Nanosystems Institute. Emily Carter is a theorist and computational scientist whose work combines quantum mechanics, solid state physics and applied mathematics. And she earned her bachelor of science degree at UC Berkeley and PhD at Caltech. So please join me in welcoming executive vice chancellor and provost Emily Carter. Thank you, Jerry. And I'm delighted to see so many people joining on this Zoom. And uh, I uh, hope that the, the conference turns out as well as uh, it, it appears it will. Um, at UCLA, we believe in the power of working across disciplines. And today's collaboration between the UCLA Anderson Forecast and the UCLA Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering is a testament to this. I'm grateful to have colleagues from both organizations with us, alongside our partners and invited guests, as we explore the future of aerospace technology and the aerospace industry in Southern California. We all know how central the aerospace industry is to our region. For more than a century, it's been a magnet bringing talent to the area, a driver of economic activity and a source of immense local pride. What may be less known is the part that UCLA has played in the evolution of the industry and its success. UCLA research in the 1950s helped prove the feasibility of space exploration and built a blueprint for the establishment of a space station high above the earth. Ours was the first US university to offer a course in rocket navigation and the first to graduate a PhD specializing in astronautics. In the 1960s, UCLA researchers were involved in the development of fuel injection. And in the years since, our research and partnerships have improved air cargo transportation, spacecraft navigation systems, and much more. Our graduates power the industry too, working at top aerospace companies like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, as well as NASA. Perhaps most notably, at least more recently, UCLA Aerospace Engineering alumna Megan MacArthur will be piloting SpaceX Crew-2 to the International Space Station this coming spring. As we'll hear today, the aerospace industry will continue to be a vital force affecting California for years to come. 
with developments like the recent awarding of a federal grant to UCLA and Starburst to create an aerospace innovation hub, our institution will continue to serve an essential role in the industry's advancement. Now, to speak more about the regional economy and the aerospace industry, I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker, Congressman Ted Liu. Congressman Liu represents the 33rd Congressional District in the US House of Representatives, a district which includes UCLA. In the six years since his election to the House, he has shown himself to be a strong advocate for the public interest. He has been a much needed leader on critical issues like climate change, cybersecurity, consumer protection, and serving the needs of our military veterans, especially those suffering from homelessness. He also has been a good friend to UCLA, coming to campus often to share his insights and to hear the perspectives of those in our community. His relationship with our institution exemplifies the kind of open, thoughtful, and respectful exchange of ideas that helps both academics and government leaders achieve the greatest impact. I'm grateful to Cong Congressman Liu for joining us for sharing his perspectives on the regional economy and participating in today's discussion. So I'll turn the program over to him. Congressman Liu, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so honored to speak uh, before all of you today and thank you to UCLA for inviting me. I thought I'd just open up really quickly to give you an update on the stimulus package uh, in Congress and then I'll, I'll talk about aerospace. Um, as you may know, the House of Representatives passed on May 15th, the HEROES Act, $3.4 trillion to do a second round of stimulus to American people. And prior to that, we had passed four bipartisan laws uh, to help the American people. And my view was that those laws were necessary, uh, but not sufficient to deal with the scale of the crisis. And that's why we needed a second stimulus package. Unfortunately, the White House and the Senate basically twiddled their thumbs for uh, many months and didn't act. So we negotiated against ourselves and passed a second version, uh, which was 2.2 trillion. So now the US Senate has two versions of HEROES Act. They could send any one of those two bills uh, to the president for signature and we would get relief out to American people. There are ongoing talks now uh, to try to uh, get something like that done. And my hope is it can be done during this lame duck session uh, in December. Uh, if it happens, that'll be great. Uh, if not, then we're going to uh, work with uh, President Biden next year and get the second round of stimulus out uh, to the American people. So that's where we are. I'm happy to answer any questions on that. And then in terms of aerospace, uh, let me uh, start off by saying uh, what an amazing place uh, Southern California, Los Angeles County is for aerospace development. I'm just going to give you uh, some facts uh, that we gathered from CalBiz and LAEDC in terms of uh, the aerospace industry. Uh, we know, for example, that aerospace activity in the national security field generates nearly 800,000 direct and indirect jobs for Californians. It produces a total economic impact of $156 billion each year. I happen to do my airport reserve duty at the Space Missile Systems Center uh, at Los Angeles Air Force Base. And we know that the Space Missile Systems Center uh, designs, develops, and purchases more than $9 billion uh, worth of space missile systems for the Air Force. And now it's going to be the Space Force. Uh, in addition, uh, California's aerospace industry claims 10% of the entire global market. Uh, the space sector, uh, the lion's share of which is in LA area, is a $20 billion industry that claims 24% of the global market. And we're here in LA County home to a number of uh, amazing uh, products and inventions and vehicles, including the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, the Northrop Grumman Global Hawk unmanned vehicle, the SpaceX Falcon rocket, uh, the fuselage for the F-18 Super Hornet, and, and many others. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, we're able to do this is because we have this uh, amazing synergy uh, and cluster of not just companies, but also amazing institutions uh, like UCLA and Caltech and USC, along with federally funded research and development centers, such as the Aerospace Corporation, uh, NASA Jeff's Propulsion Laboratory and RAND's Project Air Force. And then we got a military base here uh, with the Space Missile System Center. And then when you add in um, all their years of experience that we have in terms of uh, personal expertise, 
uh, it is uh, one of the preeminent, if not the preeminent places to go if you're interested uh, in aerospace. Uh, there's a saying uh, in the aerospace industry that it takes uh, that for, uh, to have a rocket scientist of 20 years, it takes 20 years. And so you can't just sort of go to the middle of Wyoming and say, hey, we're going to start building rockets and satellites and um, uh, other uh, sorts of aerospace products. Uh, you have to have, uh, first of all, experienced people. You've got to have a cluster of companies and military and research institutions. And there's very few places uh, like LA County. And my view is we need to build upon this, uh, which is why uh, I have uh, started with Republican Congressman Ken Calvert of the California Aerospace Caucus, uh, where we go ahead and lobby and support the aerospace industry in California. Uh, as many of you know, uh, with Space Force standing up, they're going to have a headquarters. Um, hopefully we can get it in California. Uh, if that doesn't happen, there are various commands under Space Force. One of them is Systems Command. And I think that Los Angeles Air Force Base would be a perfect place to house Systems, systems Command for the US Space Force. And so that's something that Congressman Ken Galbert and I and the rest of the California delegation uh, through our California Aerospace Caucus are working hard to do to try to uh, get that uh, located here uh, right uh, in Southern California. Uh, we also, as you know, have the nation's only startup accelerator, uh, Starburst, and I've been trying to get additional funding uh, for accelerators, so very pleased uh, that we were able to help the Los Angeles Area Aerospace Ventures Accelerator Enhancement Project get a $1.4 million federal grant, and it's um, sort of things like this that continue to make uh, LA County uh, one of the best places uh, for aerospace. And as we sort of look towards the future, uh, this is good not only for economy, but also for our national security. Uh, having served an active duty in the US Air Force, it's very clear to me that the reason the United States uh, has the preeminent military and the best uh, sort of um, technology in the world is not because we uh, have these products, it's because we have these products first. And so it's very important that we're ahead of other countries, uh, whether it comes to satellites or it comes to jet aircraft uh, or cybersecurity or, or cyber technology. Uh, as long as we can be ahead of other countries, then we're going to maintain a qualitative military and national security edge. And that's why it's so important to continue the innovation uh, that we get uh, with uh, this aerospace industry here in Southern California. Uh, so with that, happy to answer any questions any of you may have. And thanks so much uh, for inviting me. Thank you, Congressman Liu. Uh, we do have some questions. Uh, let me begin with um, th th let me begin uh, with this one. You know, we've observed over the last four years, certainly over the last two years, a, a beginning of a decoupling, not just with China, but uh, from much of the rest of the world when it comes to high technology products, but especially China. Uh, do you see that onshoring, that pulling back of the development of aerospace technology benefiting Los Angeles, or do you think that it's going to go elsewhere? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And as well, your thoughts on how that might continue or not continue as we move into the next four years with the Biden administration? Uh, thank you, Jerry, for that question. So as all of you know, the Trump administration has um, not had a good relationship with China. Uh, my view is that the US-China relationship is one of the most critical relationships in the 21st century. If it goes badly, it will be bad for both the US and China as well as the rest of the world. Uh, if it goes well, uh, then it's gonna go well for both countries. And so I think it's important uh, that it not go badly. Uh, I don't necessarily disagree with the Trump administration trying to change China's trade practices. Uh, China has uh, had really bad trade practices. They've also stolen uh, US intellectual property. And there are things that China just needs to change. Uh, I do disagree with the president's sort of heavy handed approach in terms of tariffs. Uh, you'll see we really didn't win that trade war um, and it sort of hurt both countries. I think the Biden administration would be much more nuanced when it comes to uh, China. Uh, having uh, served in that foreign affairs 
committee now for a number of years, it's very clear to me that um, with not just China, but a lot of other countries, we're not going to agree with them on everything uh, or disagree with them on everything. Uh, so we just have to learn to segment, which means maybe we work with China, you know, on nuclear issues the way we did with, you know, the Iran deal um, and trying to contain Iran. Uh, but then when it comes to issues uh, like agriculture, we're going to disagree with them. Uh, so you just have to learn to deal with each country's issues uh, in a segmented basis. Uh, so that you don't um, give up opportunities that we otherwise could have. And I think the Biden administration is going to be uh, much more uh, nuanced in dealing with China. Uh, so in terms of, for example, rare earth uh, minerals and, and other technology, uh, it'd be good if uh, we got more of that. It'd be good if we also, uh, in terms of our domestic supply, could be less reliant uh, on countries such as China or or, or other places, um, it's a complicated issue and um, look forward to any ideas any of you may have. Uh, so my view is we need to get more technology from different countries, uh, but also would not be relying on them as we look towards the future. Great, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, uh, Los Angeles has a long history of innovation and leadership in incubating and developing new aerospace technologies and and you spoke to that a moment ago, uh, but many other parts of the country today are staking claims for future investment. Uh, how should the federal government continue to nurture all these contenders for new aerospace investment uh, while still protecting the agglomeration effects that we have here in Southern California that makes it a, a kind of ideal place? Uh, so in other words, it's kind of a, a sharing the wealth uh, but taking advantage of what we have question. Uh, so one way uh, is through federal grants. Uh, so again, I'm very pleased we were able to get a, a federal grant uh, for uh, um, to help with accelerators. And it's also uh, very clear that um, some of technology is driven by the military. So we do have our own military base here, Los Angeles Air Force Base. And uh, with the Space Missile Systems Center, uh, it is poised to get even more important uh, as the air, as a space force stands up. And um, I believe the Biden administration will in fact continue the space force. Uh, I do think a uh, continued focus on space is extremely important because it helps all the branches of service as well as our intelligence agencies, um, as well as our, our, our commercial uh, space needs as well. And again, you can't just, you know, sort of you know, go to South Dakota and try to set up a, a space cluster and, and, and start working on satellites and rockets and so on. Um, I also think uh, we need to continue to make sure our educational institutions get the funding that they need. So uh, the pandemic uh, has affected a lot of um, education, not just K through 12, but also uh, higher institutions of learning. Uh, so in the CARES Act, uh, there was some funding uh, for colleges and universities. I think we need to get them more. And uh, their stimulus package being debated in Congress right now. Um, at least the House proposal does have more money uh, for uh, or higher education learning institutions. Um, we also need to uh, make sure that we prepare kids uh, when they're very young, because by time you try to prepare a kid who's a senior in high school, it's, it's far too late. And studies show uh, that again, the most that anyone can do to help a human being is in the years zero through five. And so I'm a big believer in uh, pre-K education and any sorts of um, programs that will help kids ages zero through five. If you want a rocket scientist, that's the best thing you can do is to help someone who's age zero through five so that 30 years later, uh, they can help develop the next generation rocket. Uh, th thank you. And that uh, leads to the next question, which is, is, is related. And I think you've mostly answered it, but maintaining a strong aerospace workforce is essential to innovation, technology, translation, uh, translation and manufacturing scale up. Uh, how can Los Angeles improve its competitiveness for a strong local workforce for aerospace. And in particular, uh, how might uh, the federal and state government 
um, through policy weigh in on this and uh, prepare the LA workforce for the 21st century of aerospace? Uh, that's a uh, great question and, and uh, it's a complicated answer. So I'll give you some thoughts I have on that. When I was uh, chair of the Aerospace Select Committee in California State Legislature, I remember doing a hearing on workforce needs and Raytheon came on and testified. And I remember them saying that, you know, their CEO doesn't lose sleep at night because of increased regulations or taxes. Uh, they said that their CEO loses sleep because they couldn't fill the open positions that they have. And that continues to remain a problem. A lot of these uh, aerospace companies uh, still have challenges filling the open positions that they have. And not all their positions require, you know, a PhD uh, or a master's or so on. Some of their positions simply um, require someone to have gone to a uh, community college for two years and learn some technical skills so that they can help put together a rocket. Uh, and so uh, there is still a mismatch um, even now between the workforce uh, that industry needs and what kind of graduates are coming out. And so we need to continue to focus on and make sure that we get more people into uh, STEM, uh, more uh, graduates in engineering, but also people to get career technical education so they can uh, fulfill uh, some of the uh, other requirements that these uh, aerospace companies need. Uh, separate and apart from that, we have uh, significant housing issues. And so um, even though some of these companies uh, do offer uh, generous salaries, uh, if your first home is going to be massively expensive or your rent is going to be really high, uh, that could uh, dissuade you from wanting to come to LA County and work in one of these companies, uh, or you might have to you know, live uh, an hour and a half away and, and drive in, and, and not a lot of people want to do that. So we got to uh, continue to work on, on housing issues. Um, and it's uh, sort of quality of life issues uh, that people pay attention to. So they're gonna pay attention to school districts. And again, we need to continue to make sure that our um, K through 12 uh, and higher education institutions are funded the best that we can. Thank you. And we have a little bit of time left. Uh, so a question that I have, uh, I know that you uh, sponsored a bill on climate change and have been involved with that. Uh, and the Biden administration, at least in the campaign, has said that climate change is going to be an important part of their policy initiatives. Uh, how can the local aerospace industry both take advantage of that shift to uh, research and development in climate change and, um, and contribute to it? Uh, so I'm very pleased that um, the Biden administration is, well, first of all, going to believe in science. That's helpful. And second, uh, that President Biden himself has made climate change one of his top issues. If any of you watched his acceptance speech uh, at the DNC convention, he mentioned four items that he was going to focus on. Climate change was one of the four. And then you see with his um, nominations, uh, he's already um, put that uh, climate change priority uh, as one of the highest priorities by nominating, um, actually, uh, John Kerry won't need a Senate confirmation. So John Kerry will, in fact, be the climate czar. And he's going to have a seat uh, at the National Security Council. Uh, first time in US history that's happened. And so Biden has elevated climate change, not just as an issue, but as an issue of fundamental importance to our national security which is, I believe, a place where it belongs. Uh, on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, I remember we held a hearing on the national security ramifications of climate change. Uh, we know from Pentagon reports that a number of our bases are particularly susceptible to climate change, uh, whether it's from flooding uh, or uh, significant uh, hurricanes or typhoons. Uh, we've got military uh, infrastructure uh, that is a, a threat. In addition, climate change also causes movements of people through migration uh, that could cause uh, instability problems in different parts of the world. And then when you have lack of resources, uh, whether it's lack of uh, energy or lack of access to water or food, uh, that also causes peace and instability. So I'm pleased that the Biden administration is 
um, very focused on climate change. And when you look at uh, the aerospace industry, uh, there is a complete and clear connection to uh, climate change uh, in the sense of, for example, satellites uh, that uh, climate scientists need. Um, also sensors, a lot of what our aerospace companies do is they uh, work on amazing sensors and that kind of technology is also important uh, for climate change measurements. Uh, so there's a lot of synergy, uh, I believe, with the aerospace industry and climate change. And that's uh, something that I think is going to um, grow uh, in a Biden administration. Great, so we have a number of questions about the Space Force uh, and uh, some of them are about what is the Space Force going to do? Uh, is, is it uh, uh, appropriate use of public funds to try and send a manned mission to Mars, et cetera? So perhaps you could uh, uh, help us understand the Space Force and how that is going to relate to local aerospace industry. Sure. Um, so the Space Force uh, is going to be focused on national security, national defense, um, both offensive and defensive weapons platforms, it's not gonna be focused on sending uh, human beings to Mars. Uh, so that will continue to be the province of NASA. Let me actually talk about that first. Uh, I fully support sending human beings to Mars. Um, so I'll give you a story. I remember um, visiting uh, Egypt um, many years ago and, and going to these pyramids and looking at um, all these uh, amazing uh, ancient artifacts and learning about King Tut. And um, I want you to think about why is it that we know a lot about King Tut? Is it because he did amazing things? Is it you know because uh, he uh, developed or did a lot of great things for his people? Uh, no, not at all. It's because we happened to find his tomb intact. Uh, there were lots of other Egyptian pharaohs that did some pretty amazing things that none of us learn about um, because we didn't find their tombs uh, intact. And when you sort of think about scales of 5,000 years, right? And think about what we remember, um, 5,000 years from now, I'm not sure if people would actually even remember, for example, um, let's say uh, President um, Clinton. We might not even talk about him. But I think they'll talk about the first person on the moon. And I think they also remember the first person that landed on Mars. Um, and when you sort of look out in the future, I do think space exploration uh, is key to humankind and that we need to continue space exploration. We need to find out what's out there in the universe um, and continue to uh, find and explore uh, our space as best we can. Uh, so now back to uh, the Space Force in terms of right now, uh, how we defend ourselves. Uh, I do think that space is continuing uh, to be uh, one of the most um, important domains uh, in the military. Um, if you control space, uh, that gives you a huge advantage in, in the uh, military conflict. It gives you a huge advantage in peacetime with the ability to spy uh, what is happening in other places in the world. And I think we need to continue to invest more in space, not less. And so I support having a space force. I support having a lot of expertise uh, in space. It's one of those areas where you can't actually be 95% correct, for example. You can't launch a rocket and say, you know, we want it to work at the 95% level because if um, it hits you know, the failure rate of that 5%, it's gonna explode or it's gonna do something really bad. You can't really launch a satellite in orbit and you know be off by a mile. It's going to cause problems. So um, space requires a certain amount of expertise and perfection uh, that you don't really need in a lot of other places. And so it does require, I believe, the best and brightest in the world and a lot of experience and a lot of people working on this uh, who are trained. Um, so I fully support the Space Force. And whatever I can, can do to help it, uh, I will. Okay, and I think we have time for one last question. Um, so this is, is there uh, any specific assistance or incentives that are being provided or that 
uh, you know of that are uh, being talked about uh, for small aerospace businesses? Uh, so I, I don't know um, in a biodiversity how that's going to work. Uh, there are um, discussions uh, now about having Congress reassert more of a role in appropriations in terms of uh, specific uh, monies to various programs. And we don't know how exactly that's going to pan out. It's something that uh, the House is going to decide working in conjunction with the Biden administration. But I do think uh, that the Biden administration will continue uh, to focus on space. And if anyone has sort of any specific programs that you think I should advocate for, please let me know. Uh, every member of Congress, uh, basically every year, we write a letter uh, to the Appropriations Committee uh, with programs that we support. Uh, and so if anybody has a specific uh, program, please uh, let me or my staff know and we will uh, advocate for it. Great. Well, thank you, Congressman. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here. And I think we've learned a lot from your remarks. So we are most appreciative to welcome you back to UCLA, however virtually this is, and look forward to the time when we can welcome you back to campus. Thank you so much. And um, I really appreciate you giving me this opportunity. And let me uh, conclude on something hopeful. Uh, as all of you know, we've got vaccines now uh, that are very likely gonna be approved in December. Um, they're gonna start rolling out and we're not gonna be doing this virtually a year from now. Uh, but in the meantime, please make sure that you wash your hands frequently, engage in social distancing and wear a mask in public. Um, and thank you again for uh, inviting me. Thank you, and that's good news. We can't wait to get back on campus and in the classroom with our students. Great, have a good day. Thank you. Uh, so now let's turn to our panel. And we have a, a, a great panel. So the panelists are here. Uh, and our panel today is going to dig deeper into issues revolving around the innovation, development, and production of technologies and products that will have a profound effect on the aerospace sector here in Southern California, and, and really dig into some of the things that Congressman Liu was talking about. Well, we have with us today uh, two distinguished guests, uh, as well as uh, Professor Tim Fisher, who will be joining us and will moderate questions from the audience. Uh, and, uh, you know, kind of on a personal note, when I was in aerospace, which was specifically commercial transport production in the 1980s and early 1990s, uh, we saw a boom followed by a dramatic decline in the sector uh, that really dominated the local economy. Uh, the uh, recession of 1990 was a relatively mild recession elsewhere in the US and, and fairly severe and lasted uh, to the middle of the decade here in Southern California. And the common narrative was that this sector would be smaller uh, which it is, and would exist where labor was cheaper and environmental laws less stringent than Southern California, that basically it would move out of its uh, original home here. Uh, but the common narrative was wrong, and innovation and entrepreneurship, always strong suits of, of Southern California, uh, have resulted in a reinvention of the industry from the assembly of large transports to a race towards Mars and space and what we want to do with our panel of experts is uncover what's happened in recent years and what this says about the future of aerospace innovation and technology in general and Los Angeles in particular. Uh, and while I have more than enough questions for our panelists to take up the next 45 minutes, uh, we want this to be interactive. So please put your questions into the Q&A chat uh, and uh, Professor Fisher will be uh, moderating that and asking them as well. Uh, so now let's uh, begin with our panel. Uh, Professor Ahmadi is listed as one of the panelists, but uh, unfortunately uh, we found out uh, not very long ago that he's unable to be with us. Uh, but we do have a distinguished panel here for you today. And let me begin with uh, Van Espavodi. Uh, he's co-founder and managing partner of Starburst. And in his role with Starburst, he is championing, championing, championing 
today's aerospace renaissance, uniting early stage technology innovators with private investment to modernize infrastructure and mobility, communications, and intelligence. He launched Starburst in 2015, and it is operating globally today with offices in Los Angeles, Paris, Munich, San Francisco, Singapore, Tel Aviv, Abu Dhabi, and Montreal. His team works alongside of more than 500 technology startups developing new aircraft, spacecraft, satellites, drones, sensors, autonomy, robotics, and much more. And he is an entrep entrepreneurial futurist. Uh, Van has over 16 years of experience in aerospace, identifying future trends, shaping product strategy, and investment trade policies. Uh, and uh, so let me start with Van. Maybe you can tell us about uh, Starburst and how the latest Starburst UCLA grant impacts the aerospace technology ecosystem in Los Angeles. Thank you, Jerry. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. All right. Um, thank you all. Happy to be here. Um, really appreciate the opening remarks, um, especially Congressman Liu. We're, we're really grateful for your support. Um, so for those of you that don't know, and really, Jerry, appreciate the, the, the introduction. Um, Starburst is attempt, attempt doing its best to um, highlight the capability of entrepreneurs, and we have one on this panel. Um, so there, for the last, uh, I'd say, decade, uh, thanks to the new big space companies, we heard about SpaceX, we we're hearing about Amazon doing a Kuiper Belt, um, and beyond space, you know, and looking at leveraging aerospace technology and in, in supersonic capabilities, um, scramjet capabilities. There's a, there's a lot more going on in urban air mobility, electric vertical takeoff and landing systems. But that engineering talent um, has struggled to couple with bold business cases and investment cases from the venture capital community. And in the last decade, thanks to our tech tycoons, we've seen uh, an outrageous um, lowering of barriers and a resurgence of non-traditional capital, um, setting records of, of investment dollars in the billions, um, which have not slowed down during the times of COVID uh, that have essentially backed this more uh, stronger notion of open innovation. And so what Starburst is doing is creating that platform and bringing that community of the investors, the industry champions, um, the government customer and operators, and the innovators and entrepreneurs that are bringing that rapid product development mindset and capability into a much more complicated way of developing these engineering capabilities um, for the civil, commercial, and defense markets. So happy to be here and look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Van. And our next panelist is uh, Norris T. Norris is CEO and co-founder of Exosonic. Uh, Mr. T served as the chief executive of this Los Angeles-based aerospace firm, which is developing the world's first quiet supersonic airliner. Ever since childhood, Mr. T has been passionate about faster travel. Due to his passion, he attended UCLA as an aerospace engineer, uh, the class of 2014. And while on campus, he explored both entrepreneurship through technical entrepreneurship community and rocketry through UCLA's rocket project. In industry, he continued to pursue his passion for faster travel by working at three different aerospace companies, all on projects that broke the sound barrier. It wasn't until his last role at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works on NASA's X-59 low boom supersonic demonstrator that he determined low boom supersonic commercial flight was the future. After serving in that capacity, he pursued an MBA at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. It's not quite Anderson, but, uh, but a very good school uh, where he co-founded Exosonic. Uh, so Norris, uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about the airliner you're developing and how that might dramatically change commercial aviation. Yeah, certainly. So uh, thank you again for the introduction and the opportunity to speak on this panel, especially on my alma mater. Uh, I'll do that virtually. Uh, so as the introduction mentioned, I've, I've been really passionate about faster flight and then looking for a technical solution to that in the most near-term uh, possible way. And 
at Lockheed Martin, I, I thought that quiet supersonic travel was that answer. Um, I think all of us have experienced the pain of long flights and all of us don't want our flights to continue being that long. And so we want to develop a way that we can more quickly travel around the world so that we can visit families, conduct business, or, or just experience other parts of the world. And we think if you can fly supersonically while meeting the sonic boom, that's the most feasible way of doing that. Uh, so uh, when I was at Douglas Aircraft and later at Boeing, we were looking at this. <laughs> and of course, one of the issues was the sonic boom over land and over populate, populated areas. And, and, and then the idea came up of having, uh, having two separate propulsion systems. Uh, so one would get you uh, away from population centers and then the other took you supersonic. Uh, but apparently you all have been solving that problem. Yes, we, uh, we try to meet the sonic boom through aerodynamic shaping. And it's certainly stuff that's been developed by the industry uh, and other nations for the past 30 years. Uh, so let's turn to some general questions. So aerospace typically has long lead times from concept to production. And, you know, I do certainly remember this in commercial transport and those lead times have, uh, have increased. Uh, but we live in a much faster paced world with technology changing uh, at, at a rate that it never has before. So what new developments have you all seen that's going to improve that span time from innovation to, uh, to production and, and uh, usable product. Who would like to Norris, I'll let you go first, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Or even, well, sorry, sorry, Ben? No, go ahead, yeah, yeah. All right, well, uh, certainly, Jerry, your, your observation that in commercial aviation, uh, regulations are really important to that uh, for going from con concept to uh, commercial service. So I think there are, are definitely some ways in which we can decrease the design cycle. Um, however, when you go into manufacturing and then flight test and certification, uh, there are just some inherent barriers to that uh, for good reason, safety, right? Because in commercial aviation, there is zero tolerance for safety uh, or safety risk that is. Um, however, between concept to uh, you know flight test phase, there's a lot of things that can be done. and the industry has certainly matured that design cycle through uh, technology maturation in terms of computational power and analysis and understanding of, you know, just supersonic aircraft design. And we certainly are adopting all of those lessons learned. We have a number of veterans on our team to help uh, do that. And we also have <clears throat> other team members that are very experienced in these new computational tools that allow us to iterate quickly uh, and efficiently through the design cycle. I'd like to add to that. So I think traditionally aerospace has taken the most um, safety critical approach uh, because it's necessary um, because we are launching exquisite technology which can cost um, tens of millions to, hundred, to over hundred million in sending into space. Um, and the cost model behind this really didn't make sense. So putting up utmost paramount safety into that production process was, was, was uh, just, it made sense. Um, what we've seen in the com computing world, what we've seen in the automotive sector, what we've seen in transportation elsewhere, um, has seen significant leaps in how that risk approach is managed in a more dynamic way in that pro proof of concept development and that product development cycle. And aerospace in particular, I'd say is one of the last remaining industries because of that inherent safety culture um, to think about um, where, how it, how it manages risk congruency at what stage of agile product development. So at what point do you shift away from a sort of a, a battleship mindset of you build this once they've requested and it'll take us a few years to finish it versus an iterative kind of design process oriented um, cycle. And maybe Tim or others can comment on that later, but I think it, it, this is a truly an exciting time where we're, we're witnessing traditional aerospace working with a new workforce that's trained in thinking more agile, more dynamically in how they bring risk into that development cycle process. And so it's really accelerating um, that uh, uh, product maturity on its head. And in, in, now we're seeing additive manufacturing, 3D printing, um, looking at how 
humans on the factory floor interact with new software tools that optimize their capability in managing that risk. So it's really an exciting time. Uh, Tim, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I, I think all of those points are, are you know, they're valid and happening and we need to push, right? It's a constant push to make things go faster. That's how companies that have <clears throat> decreased their product uh, life cycle time or product design time have, have made it happen. Um, I, would, I actually worked for uh, Motorola back when it was a great company uh, in the early 90s. And we had this you know, 10X cycle time reduction program and it really was pervasive. And that was what drove a lot of us. And some of it was a little bit better digital design tools. And some of it was um, you know, people working smarter. <clears throat> One of the things that I'm seeing in, um, in new aerospace technology hard, on the hardware side uh, is that people are trying to put, um, put devices and components into more extreme conditions. The turbine blades are a good example of that, um, but also for supersonic and hypersonic flight. Um, and so providing uh, testing services that are accessible. So the idea would be you know, having testing services that could be provided by a vendor or at a university where people could just plug in and get the data that they need and use it for that risk reduction. That's a missing element for, I think, speeding things up. And I think that there's a lot to do to do there um, as we go forward and as, as the industry becomes more nimble. I hope LA is a place where that happens. Yeah, when, when I was working on uh, for Douglas Aircraft on the uh, MD-80 production side, one of the key issues in this regard was uh, mobility of, uh, of the workforce between jobs. So I think uh, someone, maybe it was uh, Norris has, had suggested about, or, or, or Van that, I, oh, I think it was Van, you were talking about uh, how interaction with new software. Uh, what, what we found though was, you know, as production ramped up, better jobs sort of higher up in the hierarchy opened up and people who had more seniority wanted to move up and uh, as they moved into those jobs, you know, you sort of had the average position on the learning curve moving up uh, and, and that that was an issue. So, you know, that may be uh, sort of part of the solution of somehow incentivizing people to stay in the same kind of position so that they move down the learning curve fast and, and, and you can achieve those safety goals. Uh, one follow-up question to that is, uh, you know, in the uh, both Boeing and SpaceX in sending um, sending packages, sending uh, uh, rockets to the um, space station, they started out by sending unmanned uh, and, and just sending cargo. Uh, is that the kind of thing that can do a proof of concept and can actually speed up certification? Because um, since there weren't people on board, you can perhaps do that safety testing uh, while still moving the product into, um, into the commercial sphere. Uh, is, is that a strategy that you all have been thinking about or is that just specific to these two companies in that mission? I would argue uh, humans will always fall into every one of these logistics um, value propositions. That's just, just the last part of it. So we'll, we're always going to test everything with automation, with freight, cargo um, first, and then and then once we can uh, validate that that's working and you reduce the risk profile, then it's about bringing the humans into it, whether it's space, supersonic, hypersonic, um, even in the urban uh, environment. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Well, I mean, I think doing a, a non-human mission could be really valuable in help testing out the vehicle even in the aircraft sense, right? I mean, if we're looking at de designing a supersonic UAV in kind of the short term in the mid 2020s timeframe, and that will help prove out some of our low boom and supersonic aircraft construction development capabilities. And then those, uh, those engineering goals accomplished by the supersonic UAV will of course help inform a lot of the piloted versions of the supersonic airliner, right? Uh, but in the sense of going mil military and commercial, I mean, there is the potential of doing supersonic cargo troop transport as well that we've been exploring with the Air Force. 
And <clears throat> there could be the possibility where there's an Air Force version of the airliner before there's a, a commercial version. And we can work with the military to achieve some of those safety goals and go through the military regulation process to help be a stepping stone towards the FAA certification process. I want to double down on that. I think many people mm -hmm. tend to get discouraged when they hear um, about innovation technology, innovative technologies being um, championed by the defense industry. And I think it's prudent that we always remember that everything from the blue dot on your phone, from GPS satellites, which is still maintained by the US Air Force and Space Force, um, were mostly um, leapfrogged and developed during the Cold War era. And so all these new capabilities tend to always be um, sanctioned and backed and initiated by the defense industry before it's handed off for uh, to the private to the commercial sector to kind of run with it and create those business cases and continue to scale up on that front. Yeah, and, and, and that was the argument that uh, Airbus made in their uh, subsidies dispute with the Boeing Corporation that uh, real advances in aerospace have been funded by defense departments. So how do you define, you know, subsidies? Uh, let's move on to Los Angeles. So we have a, a vibrant aerospace industry here. Uh, you know, in my introductory remarks, I talked about how in, by 1995, the narrative was we were talking about the end of aerospace. Uh, what, what happened and why is it, uh, you know, why is Los Angeles uh, such a center of aerospace technology and innovation? So this is something I'm pretty fond of, uh, always reminding everyone that yes, there's always the heritage here. Yes, there's incredible things happening in Palmdale, things that Norris did in his past life that are still kind of behind closed doors and no one's supposed to know about. Um, yes, there's uh, an incredible economic engine in LA. I think it's a federally designated hub for manufacturing. Um, so the history and the pedigree is there. But simultaneously, people tend to forget it's the largest concentration of engineering talent in, in the country, if not competitively in the world. Um, the diversity of universities expands beyond just the top tier universities, but community colleges that are pumping out um, incredibly uh, talented technicians that go and work in, in, in production of some of these capabilities. And then finally, um, the, the sort of the young and emerging uh, talent that I don't know. I don't want to call them the millennial generation. I don't want to call them the post Snapchat generation, but there, there is this incredible digital media um, um, talent pool that's thinking about bringing that digital mindset into the world of, of what aerospace means. And to us, it doesn't just mean engines and spacecraft anymore. It means bleeding edge capabilities. It means frontier enabling capabilities. And when you mix this kind of, um, talent pool uh, that, uh, that is media savvy, digitally savvy, that's looking at visualization capabilities, edge computing capabilities, analytics to support communications infrastructure. To us, that's what really defines aerospace and that's what we're really proud to continue to work with UCLA and many others with and, and continue to champion that in Southern California. Yeah, certainly, and I'd like to add on to that. Of course, we come here not only for the talent, which is plentiful. I mean, I, I graduated from UCLA down the street from where I live. Um, so that's also really great. Supply chain is obviously here as well, in addition to some testing centers. I mean, Edwards Air Force Base has a supersonic corridor, which allows us to test a supersonic airplane. And it's just, you know, 90 minutes away from Los Angeles, which is really great. And another thing, more on the commercial aviation side, I mean, LAX is a huge hub for, you know, for commercial airlines. And of course, a lot of our potential customers uh, operate there. And there's a lot of airlines that have uh, sites that are in Los Angeles. So that makes it you know, really convenient for us to go talk to commercial airlines, uh, go talk to the military, talk to suppliers, recruit students. Uh, and it's all this synergy that's here, let alone the diversity of other industries, such as Hollywood, music, technology, that we can all recruit for because, you know, we're an aerospace engineering company, but that doesn't mean we don't take people from, say, Hollywood or from tech. I want to add one more item. I think it's really important to realize we experienced a, a big shift in the last few years. Um, anyone that was developing cutting edge capabilities often had to run back to Menlo Park and Silicon Valley to secure funding. 
Um, that's no longer the case. You have local LA investors, you have private capital, private equity, that's, um, that's not as familiar with aerospace, but wants to get more involved. And so we've seen Venice Beach, we've seen Hollywood investors getting involved in geospatial imagery investing, getting involved in supersonic. So it's, it's really a, a sign of the times that's important to reflect on. Our capital's also getting smarter about those investment opportunities that are being developed locally. So, so what is driving that? Is it uh, just rate of return or diversifying venture investment uh, or something else? Dan probably knows more about this than I do. He's probably talked to a lot more people in the industry than I have. Um, but I mean, there's a mixture of investors, right? There's that, 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 that believe in a vision and have a passion for technology that entrepreneurs are developing. That's one set of investors. And there are those that go for returns, right? And they have to balance their portfolio out. I mean, uh, you know, you can balance that out with technology, with, you know, consumer businesses, or you can also balance that out with longer term investments in aerospace uh, like ours, <clears throat> uh, but also have like decent returns and offer a different kind of value proposition. <clears throat> I think, yeah, I think the why now. Good. Sorry, the why now is a critical question. Why would Norris go work in these companies and decide to start his own? Um, you couldn't do that more than 10 years ago. Um, and the reality is, and something I'd love to hear more from Norris is, is what tools, what digital tools um, are able to help you simulate, do a lot of the heavy lift things that normally had outrageous budgets behind it, that normally resulted in, in a significant um, life cycle? And how is it that um, the, the sort of the technology that's available to you as a, as an, as a sort of um, uh, as a young business able to help you grow and bring that capability into fruition at such an early cycle? And I think that's incredible. And I think there's, there's, there's that many more companies out there that are achieving similar um, business cases like Norris's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so, you know, going through three different aerospace companies, I got to see a little bit about how they function. And one thing that you start to learn is that a lot of the tools that they do have access to or that they use are like anyone else, like based off first principles as they should be, right? Things that we learn at UCLA or in the engineering school. And because supersonic aircraft design has been around for 60 years, it's a pretty well understood science. Not, that's why it's engineering, right? And so there are a lot of universities that are also doing open source engineering tools. So there's not much necessary proprietary locked tools, you know, individual to each company. Now there are tools being developed in the open world. And so for example, some of our tools that we use are open source tools. And we of course add our own proprietary technology on top of it so that we can make it more distinct to our problem set. But I think that's really opened up the ability for companies like ours to succeed, despite you know maybe not having 10 plus years of experience, but we can also hire those people from industry so that we can cover you know experienced, knowledgeable veterans of the industry with new tools that allow us to design faster. Uh, so, so we've talked a little bit about workforce and workforce development, and Congressman Lou talked about that, and of course uh, you know. Tim and his colleagues are uh, certainly working very hard on developing our workforce. We at Anderson and developing uh, the business acumen for, for business success. Uh, but you know, the question is, this is a, an industry that's been growing and, and growing rapidly, uh, particularly with small innovative companies. Uh, what kind of legs does this have? Do we really have the workforce for the future, and if not, what does Los Angeles need to be doing? What are the challenges that you see? I'd like to um, I'd like to segue from the last topic to this one and remind everyone that the current um, chief of acquisition, the the person in charge of the purse strings of the Air Force and Space Force, Dr. Will Roper, wrote an op-ed piece called "E Design Before You Fly," um, and the notion that we built aircraft or fighter jets or satellite technology that was very restricted to only being used for very the highest, most classified intelligence and defense purposes 
um, is no longer going to be the sustainable model of the future. I think the there is this, as they shifted away from the F-16 to the F-22 um, being complete opposites of what's exportable and what's domestic to an F-35, which was more of an allied by design concept. Um, they've, there's now this kind of notion of how do you start to e-design an aircraft that has this exportability or modularity um, behind the export and, the, and, and how it works in, in doing international business and how these companies can develop them. So one part of it is the ease in which you're creating these technologies. And another part of it is what is the workforce that's helping you achieve that? So some of the questions that have been coming through I've, I've, I've noticed around these digital tools is, is what does that workforce look like? And it's not the way it's been over the last um, few decades. And so when we talk about e-design before you fly, um, it's very much what are the automation tools? What are the simulation tools? What are the ability to create a digital twin environment? How do you immerse yourself in a virtual reality? How do you deconstruct things using virtual um, augmented reality? And as, as the workforce continues to evolve, we're not saying they have to work the, with the sexiest, newest tools, but the reality is they're finding most of these new companies that are competing with the legacy companies are um, leveraging these efficiencies that are becoming more interoperable in today's workforce. And this isn't about automation taking our jobs. This is very much around how do you optimize the human machine interface in achieving these new capabilities digitally before you start to go into production and getting much smarter. And I talked about bringing the risk model uh, and inverting it and thinking about that completely differently. There's another company here in LA that in just under four years um, went from seed funding to now being worth over $2.4 billion by just developing 3D printed rocket engines. So uh, again, an ongoing testament of how automation is continuing to play a different role in how we look at our processes and in, in engineering, how we look at how we interact with these tools, whether it's voice recognition, whether it's um, looking at digital twins and whether it's being able to kind of simulate these capabilities um, in a digital environment. Norris, you Barry, said- I think I, if I can jump in sure. just real quick and tie in a couple of points together. Um, they're really good points. And I think that people on the call <clears throat> in the audience can benefit from it as well. What, what's happening and you know, what I see from an educator's uh, perspective is that <clears throat> by and large, the data science tools because of their origin, where they come from, um, are open source. And so the, if you want to use data science tools, you ought to be very conversant with open source tools, things like Python and Jupyter Notebook and uh, these, these free resources that are available. Uh, but then when you get to aerospace specific designs, you know, that's, you know, there's no good you know, universal open source tool for that. And so we partner with companies that have sort of an end-to-end -end vertical integration. Um, but I think the winners in that process are going to be the ones that allow for open source tools to be used as plugins for the more proprietary tools that they have. And I'm starting to see that from um, a number of different vendors where they, they will allow a Python script to do a, a sub model and plug it into their into their main routine. And I think that's a, that's a really powerful set. And of course, as an educator, we have to teach all that. And we don't teach software skills per se, like which, you know, which menu to click on this to get the line to go here or to rotate the object that our students can figure that out um, in, in a heartbeat. Um, we try to teach the first principles, like Nora said, um, and also, you know, really exercise those tools to make sure that they're uh, giving the answers that you expect um, that are faithful to the physics, um, but also at the same time, incorporating this big flood of open source tools. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I, <clears throat> every day I, I wish that I could be a student again, and I kind of am, but um, because they're so amazing. Um, they're so much more powerful than what I had access to back when I went to school. I won't tell you exactly when, but let's just say it was before open source software was a thing, so. And uh, we have uh, in our audience uh, a number of people who are not engineers, uh, but are from the Anderson School MBAs who are interested in the aerospace industry, but are 
Um, also interested in, you know, aerospace technology and startups and what role, you know, what sorts of activities might they get involved in in a career. So I'm going to lead off answering that because I was in aerospace and I'm not an engineer. Uh, uh, I'm an economist. And I found that, um, that there were plenty of roles to play because as an economist or as an MBA, you've developed uh, quantitative tools and they allow you to span uh, you know, what is happening with engineering to what is commercially viable and, and sometimes uh, help translate the engineering to, uh, to the commercial. Uh, so I found that there were plenty of opportunities, certainly in, uh, in commercial aerospace. Uh, we're interested, uh, Norris and Van, in your perspective on this. Yeah, so, so actually, uh, when I was at GSB, I started an aerospace club because I wanted to promote greater interest within the MBA community to the aerospace uh, industry, especially regarding startups. And we had a number of members who are not aerospace engineers by any stretch of the matter. Uh, and there's a number of routes that they pursued aerospace. Uh, one was project management or program management. Uh, so that really helped, for example, every company, right? Any aerospace company will have a product and that product needs to be managed from the schedule, the resources, suppliers, uh, things like that, which is really invaluable. Uh, in addition to our business specifically, we look, like, we look for people with commercial aviation or airline background because we need to understand how you know, at the end of the day, we're a business that needs to sell a product and to sell that product, it needs to be valuable to a customer. And MBAs are well positioned to do that given financial analysis, market analysis, and other uh, tools like this. Uh, more broadly though, if you wanna go in aerospace, uh, maybe at, uh, from a larger perspective, there's also private equity where a lot of small aerospace suppliers are bought, sold, traded to other companies. And, there are definitely MBAs that do some of that work, of which a few I know. And I'm happy to talk to anyone else about other aviation or aerospace jobs that don't require an engineering degree. I think if I was the um, executive of an old um, aerospace company, I'd always remind them we need just as many non-engineers to continue to help our business thrive. But I think what's very exciting and what I'd like to emphasize is is as we continue to invite uh, what was often dubbed as these non-traditionals or these kind of outsiders into what has used what used to be an oligopoly of industry, as we continue to invite the tech sector and and adjacent industry experts, when you go look at people working at some of the new up, like fast rising companies, they're not coming from aerospace. So uh, I think MBAs in particular and and business uh, acumen is is paramount in, I think, sure, and Norris, I'm not I'm gonna, please don't take any offense to this, but the, as, as many years as we've seen engineers go into MBA programs and come out, um, what, what we often find to be the most promising and inviting um, investment opportunities or the companies that have the, been the most effective in raising capital and continuing to scale in the market are those that know how to be aware of what they're good at and, and pair up and create a team with people that complement your skills, you know, strengthen your strengths. Um, don't try and convince yourself you, you you know things you don't know. And so I would encourage everyone in this audience to stay good at what they're good at and go find teammates to go partner with and build a team and go raise money together. If you want to go build a small satellite startup constellation, you can do that. You can. There are and there are incredible people that know how to build that for you here in Southern California, and they're waiting desperately to find you to build that match to go and start doing that. And that's something we really, you know, um, with uh, Dr. Fisher and, and UCLA TDG and, and others, we plan to continue to expand on regionally is to support those matches and the matchmaking to start happening more, more fruitfully and, and qualitatively. So I'm, I'm a big fan of you being interested in aerospace, not maybe necessarily understanding it, but bringing your business acumen and pedigree to complement the engineering skills of others that can help you scale a legitimate business. Yeah, I, you know, I would uh, agree. I, uh, Norris, like you, from early childhood, I used to go to the airports and just watch the airplanes take off and, um, and, and uh, even on some military bases, lie at the end of the runway and 
uh, and and it's Pretty you know cool. kind of that passion for aerospace uh, that even though uh, I'm not an aerospace engineer, uh, I did find a very rewarding and interesting career uh, in aerospace, complementing the engineers, uh, working with CFOs and and uh, planners at airlines uh, to for, to help them understand the commercial. Applicability of the products that we were producing, so mm -hmm. I think there are real opportunities there. Uh, we're getting close to the end of our time, and I wanted to be sure that I asked this question, uh, which is, uh, what do you see as the new developments in aerospace that will stay over the next five years, propel it to a new generation of products and technologies? Yeah, I probably has a wider scope than I do. <laughs> I'm pretty focused on commercial aviation at this point. <clears throat> and, and Tim, I'm sure you have some ideas on this too, but uh, mm -hmm. let's start with Van. Oh gosh, okay. Um, er, look, we've, the best part of my job is I get pitched every idea you can think of. Um, and it's incredible that some of them are actually happening, okay? Um, there is a company in Japan that's developed meteor showers on demand that burn brighter with streaks in the sky, okay? Um, there is um, the, the sort of the, the Star Wars Death Star concept, additive manufacturing, 3D printers building 3D printer parts in space. Um, and so I, I get really excited. Um, I love when people struggle with, uh, factoring the physics and the possibility of, of moving people at Mach 15 um, um, into the stratosphere and back in this whole, uh, let's get people from New York to Tokyo in, in just, you know, an hour or two or something like that. So uh, I think, I, think um, I, I personally uh, have a background in, in, in civil airspace. And so I, um, I guess, yeah, I think mobility and getting people, but also thinking specifically in LA about how manufacturing processes are being flipped and all these digital design tools, as boring as it is, I find to be fascinating. And those are the things I get really excited about. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Tim. Yeah, I, I mean, I can only give a somewhat parochial perspective because you know I <clears throat> spend a lot of my day doing my own research, but um, I would say that uh, data science and, and smart use of it is going to be crucial for a lot of different things that span across defense and commercial aviation. Um, I think uh, mobility um, down to fairly small scales, whether it's a drone or an air taxi, I think that'll be big. <clears throat> and I think mostly on the hardware side, um, it's going to come down to materials and manufacturing. So um, a lot of what we do and have done in this industry over the years, because we were making a lot of one-off parts, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of you know, deep understanding of the uh, material character um, properties at extreme conditions, very high temperatures. Um, and that dovetails, there's a couple of really good questions in here about um, component level design and, you know, sort of uh, some kind of synergy with green technology. I see that happening. Um, I don't know. I think it's, it's also a, you know, a business school um, type of, of uh, answer where, you know, whether the companies, uh, component level companies are going to be successful is going to take, you know, a really smart MBA to figure out intermediate markets before you get to a big aerospace market in many cases. Um, on green technology, there's a lot of fun things happening. I can tell you a story from my own work um, where we're looking at uh, supercritical carbon dioxide engine cycles um, that started out as mainly being thought of for solar thermal plants. So, you know, shoot a lot of light at, at a small spot and then run a, run a power cycle on that. And now they're talking about putting that into, um, into air taxis and drones. We have an ARPA-E, not a, not a DARPA or DOD contract to do that with Honeywell Aerospace. Um, 
where we're making really, really light components and we're putting them at the very edge of their safe operating range because to, that's, that's where you're gonna get the highest efficiency. Um, and those kind of things are happening. And I think that that's gonna be a, you know, there's a lot of good stories that'll come out of that um, in the not too distant future. Somebody asked me about uh, who the customer for the meteor shower is. I'll just say quickly, um, it's, so far, I've no, as far as I know, they're still figuring it out, but they've had some governments looking at kind of on par with Olympics and centennial like events. And so foreign governments have, maybe it's, we're not all Super Bowls with fireworks, but others want to do softer to kind of displays. Yeah. Maybe the solution to fireworks in California where we have a, a, a bad fire season. Well, we are working with other companies um, that are doing um, surveillance uh, with the Forest Service. Mm. And so okay. they've been in very much involved. One of our portfolio companies has been very successful in supporting uh, the Forest Service in tracking trends and understanding kind of the, the science behind what goes on with the um, increasing uh, wildfires, which is really sad, but yeah. Yeah, so when I started in aerospace, we still had uh, Rosie the Riveter who would walk out with her riveting gun and would rivet uh, segments of a fuselage together. Uh, and, and we saw uh, in the 1990s, final assembly of aircraft move out of California. Uh, labor was expensive, land is expensive. Now we have much more advanced manufacturing uh, and uh, much more efficient manufacturing. So labor productivity in the manufacturing is higher are we going to see a movement back to uh, California of final assembly of aircraft? I know we're doing spacecraft here. Uh, and what I'm thinking of is, is um, all of the auto manufacturers moved out, but now that we're moving to technologically sophisticated electric cars, they're moving back to California. Uh, do you see this as happening uh, in Los Angeles? I think that's hard to stomach right now. Um, I, I think Norris's earlier point around the supply chain is probably more valuable than long assembly lines of aircraft. So, mm -hmm. but I'll leave it to Norris to answer if he, once he gets all his billions in funding, is he going to launch his <laughs> uh, assembly, assembly line here in LA or would he choose somewhere else? Yeah, I think uh, that comes down to real estate. Where can we expand to? Can we get cheap enough real estate that we can, you know, like the land itself is going to be a large cost probably for the factory space, um, depending if we just start build new, or we can try to use an existing facility like a lot of the space companies do in Long Beach, where they take over where Boeing used to manufacture airplanes or SpaceX mm -hmm. taking over where Northrop used to build, you know, flying, uh, flying wing concepts. So that's where we would look first. Um, but we would, I mean, we would love to start manufacturing uh, in Los Angeles, if it's economical, but I think that's something pretty far in the future that we start to plan for. <clears throat> yeah, so labor is not so much a factor anymore because of robotics and advanced advanced manufacturing, but just the the floor space that you need and the cost of that becomes uh, the critical factor. And uh, that brings us to two twenty. So we are unfortunately out of time. This is an uh, an industry, an area that is fascinating, dynamic, important to our local economy, uh, and, uh, and a lot is going on today. So I want to thank uh, Van and Norris on behalf of uh, the Samueli School of Engineering and uh, Applied Science and the Anderson School of Management, and uh, Tim Fisher and myself uh, to thank both of you for being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, and thank you to all of our audience for joining us today. Uh, we hope to be continuing this conversation in the future. Uh, so- sure, Can I just add one final remark? Yes, please. As part of our um, partnership with UCLA, um, we know that you are all kind of involved in this community, but we really appreciate, we're gonna have a landing page up pretty soon in the next month before the holidays. And so in the meantime, if anyone wants to get involved with this community, we will be hosting more uh, on this topic themed programs to get people more involved in kind of what we will be doing together with UCLA 
for launching Southern California Aerospace Ventures, which is really aimed at scaling and creating jobs and, and bringing more money to the investment companies, to, to get to invest in companies in Southern California. So please don't hesitate to reach out to myself, Tim, contact at starburst.aero. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Van. Thank you, Norris. Uh, thank you to all of our audience. Uh, uh, be safe and have a great week. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it.